And over to Paco. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Well, welcome everyone to the first session of the Doctoral Consortium. Uh, we had the Doctoral Consortium last year, uh, supported by OpenTel as this year, and it was a fantastic uh, experience. Uh, in that case, we had uh, coming from Manchester, uh, Jenna Mittelmeyer to be the discussant, and today we had the pleasure to have two ex uh, IT uh, colleagues and friends coming and um, presenting and joining us from the US. As, um, they are Garon Hiller from MIT and Juan, who just joined uh, from the uh, University of uh, uh, Michigan. And uh, um, guys, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Uh, so uh, my name is Garen Hilaire. Uh, I had the pleasure of doing my uh, PhD work over at the OU as a part of IET, so it's uh, fantastic to have a chance to be back today and hear all the lovely work that's going on. Um, I've been working in a, a lab over at MIT that focuses on uh, teacher education, uh, specifically thinking about how to build more equitable classrooms. Um, so I'm, I'm, again, just pleased to be here today and excited to hear what everyone's up to. Thank you, Garon. It's great to have you here. Uh, Juan, I think you have been uh, joining us from your phone, if I'm not okay. wrong, following the icon. We are going to start in the doctoral consortium. Um, the idea is that we are going to uh, leave quite a lot of freedom to uh, students to present. So for the posters, they will have five minutes, while for the presentations, a total of 20 minutes. But you can distribute the time as you wish with the idea of trying to produce as much feedback and conversation after the presentation as possible. And in that sense, we have prepared a Google Doc uh, document to uh, add, uh, let's see if it's uh, visible. I think it's possible for that, but I'm not being able to make it visible. There should be a few in there. I don't know. Uh, I um, actually can't see the link, uh, Paco, when you post the pod. Okay. So this is this, this is the link. link. We'll try to keep it uh, updated time to time in the chat. Uh, the idea is that in that document we can provide feedback to uh, the students in three key areas. Some questions to allow reflection, uh, main comments from the, the presentation, and suggestions for improvement. And I think we are ready to start with our first uh, presenter of the Doctoral Consortium, who is Simin. Are you ready, Simin? Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? I'm Simin. Yes. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, cool. Thank you, Wiki. Yeah. Uh, 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 out. Okay, shall I get started? Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Shimin. And uh, again, now I'm at the final stage of my PhD. And uh, to be honest, the poster I'm presenting here is like an unfinished business of my thesis, which is not the main substance of my thesis because my thesis is more about linguistic analysis. If you are interested, you can go for the poster competition in OU, which I have another poster which is more about the linguistic analysis. And in this analysis, I'm more looking at the user contribution patterns in MOOC online discussion. So basically, I have try to look into different type of contribution that user make. So as you can see from here, I don't know whether I can enlarge. Yeah. So actually this is a typical thread in FutureLearn. And actually like FutureLearn doesn't have a very hierarchical kind of threading system. But from a thread, normally you can see that there is a post, which is the initiating post, which initiate a thread and then you will have different kinds of replies. And within the replies, actually, you can 
be that there are some users who will come back to the thread, which I call it subsequent contributor here. So if to differentiate from like some user who just post and then never come back again. So actually in online uh, space, there are lots of research found that there are this kind of user who are more prompt driven, we call it, because they just post and go, post and go, rather than to really engage in a more sustained or continuous conversation with others. So to some extent, I want to see that in the MOOC discussion, do we also have this kind of user? And so based on the different type of this type of contribution, then we can group user to different groups. And there are so many groups here. And to some extent, I must say that I don't know whether the user intentionally have this strategy in the online discussion or it just happens that they do it this way. Like maybe because they see some posts is interesting, so they reply and then they don't reply. But in my results, I found that at least two or three groups that worth mentioning. So there's one very huge group of user who only create new posts, i.e. they just post, they never reply to other people. In here, you can see that some of them even can post like more than 50 new posts, but without replying to other people. But admittedly, there are also users in this group who are just one time poster, like they just post one. So that can be those uh, MOOC users who drop out earlier in the course. Yeah. So at the same time, you can see from here. So for this group of user, actually the number of the number of comments that contributed to the online discussion is quite a lot, about one fourth. And then the other group of user I would like to mention is the user who only reply. So there are user who don't really create new posts but will reply to other people. But these user, there are very minority of them. And so their contribution in the discussion is very little. And I would like to highlight this group, which are the groups that who create posts and they also reply to others, but they never come back to the same thread. So let, that is what I call like they post and go. So they can be replying to other people, but they never come back again if other people reply. So there are 13% of them. So to some extent, I wonder whether this kind of people are those that who post and go. And compared to there is another group who, uh, which is the second group, who do reply to others, but at the same time, they only go back to their own thread, i.e. the thread that they initiate by them. All right. And then, so mainly there are so many groups, I don't think I want to go into details. It's just that I, in this thesis, although I haven't got the chance to investigate all this pattern, I have always been wondering that like, is it like, is there a user who just post and go or user who intend to continue uh, discussions with other people? So mainly this is my takeaway for this poster, definitely I would think that it would be good to interview the learn some of the learners to understand if this is their intentional strategy or it just happened in the discussion phase of uh, what people have been discussed at that moment of time. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Simin. Uh, please, some questions. If we don't have any questions from people here, there are also a couple of questions that have been left in uh, Teams. But as you guys are, are here right now, you get first um, opportunity to ask questions. There are questions from Teams. Uh, Vicky is saving them in the Google. Okay. Um, the first question we have for you, Shimin, is from Eileen, um, who said that she really enjoyed your poster. Uh, but she was a little bit surprised by the number of people who only posted new posts. And she just wondered if that surprised you as well. 
Uh, actually, indeed, it surprised me when I first started this project because I would think that people like to socialize with people. That's why they join the online discussion. But then, based on the literature review I've done, as well as my research, I realized that it's a quite a common phenomenon in online space. People just want to create new posts. It's more like they want to have their own voice. And at the same time, is what I talk about, the so-called prompt-driven response. So people like to respond to the video or respond to the content on the page. And at the same time, I, my, I also think that it's also based on the future learn design, because sometimes in some step, there is a discussion prompt, say, asking the learner, what do you think about this? So to some extent, actually, it's more like the user are responding to the question on the page or responding to the prompt on the page rather than replying to others. So that might prompt them to do more creating new posts rather than replying to others. Can I ask a follow-up question about the design, Shimin? Yes, please. I was just curious uh, about any form of notifications on participation within online discussions in FutureLearn. Uh, the extent to which you think the design of notifications around comments, whether they're present or not, might influence behaviors. Um, and if you were trying to influence behaviors, what kind of behaviors would you be trying to produce? Uh, in terms of notification, I know that like uh, FutureLearn is similar to other social media platforms. Like if, let's say, somebody replied to your post or liked your post or replied to the same thread, you will get a notification. That is at the early phase of the future learning. But now I remember now that user can even mute the notification now. So I think that might be some user that really just mute the notification. So that don't need to keep responding or keep looking at who replied to them. And actually in some of my more qualitative analysis in like in the thread, I did realize that there are even user like get tired of like say there are two very vocal users keep replying in the same thread like more than ten times in the thread. Then there will be other users that are, oh I hope that the bubble won't come out. Oh can you guys stop that kind of message coming out as well? So I think it's there are lots of different shades uh individual difference in this uh condition about like whether people want to just post and go or they want to engage in the same conversation and also what is the communicative norm to stop a discussion. So in terms of like about behavior, what I concern more might be those who only create new posts, especially because then we can sort of I will think that it's more individual. Like I, technology wise, I am not sure how I can prompt people to respond or not respond because I think it really depends on what their intention is in the mood. Because in mood, some people they just want to get the information and then post mainly just to finish the task rather than to engage with other users. So I'm not sure about that. But like, Garen, how do you think about it? Well, I'm just curious from a perspective of we've got these categorizations and it sounds like you have some internal intuitions around what kinds of behaviors you might try to shift people away from and sort of like just initiating posts and not engaging with others. Um, so I think mm -hmm. it would be interesting to think about what design affordances might help facilitate that, both in the prompt structure and in the notification system that's on, in the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, at first, like in my first year, I tried to collaborate with others to come up with a dashboard. So the facilitator or tutor of the discussion board can see like the different category of the learners. And we were thinking about that to intervene with those uh, users who only create new posts and those who only reply to their own thread to ask them try to uh, diverge more, but it doesn't work out. I think it's because it still takes a lot of time from the facilitator point of view to go into to pick up the learner. 
you, yeah. you might you might want to consider looking at your data and splitting it by those who have turned off notifications and those who have left them on, and see if that has mm -hmm. any influence on the way in which they behave within um, the online discussions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Garen. And on the chat, I can oh, see that someone's raised his hand. Hi, everyone. Can can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, hi. Yeah. Hi, sorry. Uh, I forgot to uh, to unmute my microphone. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, happy to be here, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, to hear about all of your work. Um, so, should I have a question? So I'm thinking of because we're 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 in a un unprecedented times with this um, pandemic, and going forward, I think more universities will will uh, switch to online and blended learning. And I think one of the aspects of this is the social aspect of the learning uh, experience. Uh, it's very difficult to replicate in an online learning environment, and I think uh, your work is 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 very promising in a way that it's focused on how can we stimulate uh, social interactions and, and conversations in online learning communication. So um, I was wondering from from your point of view, how do you think your work could feed into university strategy moving forward in this um, global health crisis? Uh. Quan, can you repeat the last part of what you're saying? Because to my speaker, I couldn't hear you. So how do you think your work could feed into the strategies of the university in um, operating in, in this uh, uh, sorry, Kwan, I really couldn't hear you clearly. If anybody can help me out. Kwan, could you type the question in the chat? You're coming through, Kwan. It's just very quiet when you when you speak. Um, but perhaps because of the, in the interest of time, uh, we are starting to run a little bit out of time. As Joe uh, mentioned, we should move on to Leslie's, and uh, Quan and Shimin can pick that up at a later date. It was a very good question. I would love to hear the answer to it. Okay, I will try. I was talking it. with the microphone mute, uh, and I was yeah. thinking, okay, was <laughs> so yeah. Uh, please, uh, we are gonna uh, use uh, take benefit of the Google Doc, so we can have. Uh, um, questions there. We are now moving forward to Leslie Boyd. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? I'm trusting that you can. Okay, stunning. All right, I'm just going to um, zip through this all really, really quickly so we can see if we can just get back into time. Um, so I'm going to treat this as an, an advert for my uh, for the poster, which is in the Microsoft Teams space. Um, and um, you can go and look at it there really quickly. Um, so um, uh, also entered it in for the poster competition in a fit of kind of inspiration and also therapy, um, because we just recently I got inspired by the recent um, Calogy session that we had about the um, intersection of personal and professional. Now that we're in this. Um, post-COVID and emerging out of lockdown situation. So I did a sort of personal and professional journey and just made it very um, chatty um, and informal, although it's actually um, communicating very serious issues about which I'm very passionate for my research. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's just something there which says that we, as PhD students, we're always um, 
are so inspired by what we're doing and it, it kind of comes from who we are and therefore there is a, a very you know kind of big integration in between personal and professional um, so um, so I've spent my professional life um, facilitating groups of people to learn how to do things better across different contexts and boundaries in an organization and um, learning about the entirety of, of, of what's going on rather than just their individual bit of it and then learning how to collaborate together to improve that. So um, I, but this poster starts out with, um, with me being like where I am now, a final year PhD student. But um, I um, originally came, you know, started with the OU um, doing MAODE H800, which we've um, a lot of people have been kind of mentioning the MAODE program while I was living in South Africa, um, and um, I've used that whole kind of technology enhanced learning discipline to overlay upon my professional consultancy to see whether we can't use the technology, technology enhanced learning. Um, you know, the infrastructure in order to facilitate collaborative learning about difficult or tricky uh, problems which are spread across contexts and boundaries. So, yay, Denise, exactly, woohoo, M-A-D-E. So, um, so, this is my research and um, it's, you know, the OU is a prime example of um, a, a distributed organization which is, you know, composed of many different practitioners, especially with remote tutors all over the place um, and um, it's, it's kind of good to see whether we can investigate whether we can use the technology to pull everybody together in a collaborative and equitable manner to um, um, grapple with difficult tricky issues and um, uh, try together to come out with some answers. So we've heard a lot about action research in this um, conference. I'm using a collaborative action research uh, methodology. It's actually inside the action research because I'm doing it inside the OU itself, um, underpinned by grounded theory method. So, um, so that's the kind of story of my research. It's already achieved impact in one particular module. We piloted it with three. One particular module has really run with it and been very successful. And we've already achieved impact in a level two chemistry module inside the OU. Um, which was has a, has a sort of series of fairly intractable problems associated with the pace and volume of the material, and the students were really struggling in this uh, year two of of a chemistry degree. Um, and um, we've we've already achieved some impact, and we've been able to integrate the evidence from tutors who are all spread, you know, all over the country, as we know, in their own locations from students, from the module team, and all of that integrated evidence has underpinned what's called a module midlife review, which is an internal management review that happens in the OU. Um, and we've implemented something called signposting, which has been designed by a tutor to help students who are um, struggling with um, uh, um, very packed blocks. In, in, in the module, so it's like a packed program tonight, and they get they can tend to get very overloaded, especially by Christmas. And so, what we've been able to do is put in a supportive intervention and back that up with RTSS, which is real time student feedback for those who are not in the OU, um, where we can flag up the signposts that the module team are aware that this is a packed program, and this is what we're doing to try and help you support you through it. And um, there is kind of light at the end of the tunnel, and you can achieve this. So it's, it's uh, um, effective. It's an emotional support as well as a practical support. And then on the other side of it, I'll stop any second now, um, I'm theorizing that unfolding process of, of organizational learning, where organizational learning is understood to be the learning that goes on between disparate practitioners who are separated. To, um, in order to identify what the issues are and what the possible interventions might be. So I'm theorizing that. I'm using grounded theory methods to underpin the theorizing of that, um, of that underlying process and uh, what it looks like. I've already written a work in progress paper. There's a reference on the um, poster. And um, who knows where it will go, but um, you know, it looks kind of interesting for this you know, whatever comes out after lockdown and the um, uh, post 
you know, em emergence from it in terms of people being having an enforced separation or any organization where the practitioners are separated or, you know, separated across the globe. I, I, I've had an, an actual interest shown from the London School of Tropical Health and Hygiene. I might have not put the name right in terms of its correct acronym, but anyway, there you go, um, who are really interested in this for um, uh, uh, looking at eye health um, framing. So, you know, just those sort of ideas where you're spreading people across the globe and you've got to try and um, integrate their um, ideas from a practical point of view and generate what's called actionable knowledge, which is um, usable and interpretable by practitioners, um, as well as being sufficiently theoretically robust for scholars. That's it. Bing. End of um, presentation. Do you have a go and look at the poster if you're interested. Um, I've also volunteered to do an hour-long dedicated session in CalRG later on in the year, so we can spend a, an entire dedicated hour on um, on the whole thing if you're if um, CalRG are interested in that. And um, thanks very much, everybody. I'll leave thank it there. Thank you very much, Leslie. I think it's the time for questions. I've got a question I've been dying to ask you, Leslie. <laughs> oh, my um, goodness, Gary. I've recently been Go in a it. working group discussing uh, ethical implications for participatory action research at multiple levels, considering youth, uh, teachers, uh, different stakeholders that might be playing roles in driving research. And so I'm really curious to hear from you on the topic of insider action research and the potentials for conflicts of interest that might arise yeah. in conducting research as an insider. And um, really the question that we've been gravitating yeah. around is, yeah. like, what are the methods or the means that you can sort of develop intrinsic motivation for moral behavior uh, in researchers that are not just holding themselves accountable to ethical standards, but really understanding the implications for um, like the questions that they're asking and, and making sure that they're doing that in, in really a, a moral way. Okay, so are, are you saying moral, Garen? Yeah. yeah. M-O-R-A-L, So there's moral. ethical standards that, you, that we typically follow, okay. but what, one of the things that we've been noticing is that um, ethics review committees don't quite work when you talk to like a seven-year-old that's doing research. In your case, is slightly different because you're doing insider research with adults. But just, just how do you think yep. about when you engage with insiders in research, like how, how do you drive towards yep. understanding ethical implications for the work? Yep. OK. OK. There's, there's a whole lot that's coming into my head there, Garen. So we, we could have a separate conversation if you like. Um, and I'm not entirely sure of the context of your research. Um, but um, the, 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 uh, the book, that I, my kind of go-to book, and it's down there on the references on the poster uh, for insider stuff, is the only book really that's around about it, which is written by David Coughlin, which is called Doing Action Research in Your Own Organization. He's uh, based in Ireland, in Dublin. And then he's written, you know, there's, there's lots of writing about um, ethics in action research and ethics in insider action research. But he talks about a concept mm -hmm. of role duality, uh, where you are um, uh, you are an insider, so by definition you're inside the organisation as opposed to a consultant or an outsider being brought in um, for their expertise. So you're part of the organisation, but equally you are a, a researcher at the same time. And this is a, um, a challenge that I've had to balance all the way through my PhD. Um, because I've had to balance in between my role as a PhD student and the fact that I'm actually doing something which is in the practice area and aiming to have practice, practical benefits um, in, inside the OU. So uh, some people will know that I'm also a co-leader with the module um, chair of an esteem project. Um, which, uh, for those who are outside of the OU, esteem is an internally funded scholarship centre which can fund external, uh, internal, I beg your pardon, internal projects, um, which we needed to give the project um, credibility and also to be able to pay our tutors who are contracted and therefore um, aren't expected to do any extra work above what they're being paid for. So um, it's, it's um, for me, it's um, 
us straddling that practice and theory and that role duality idea is a really important one. And then um, without spending too long um, on the question, um, there, there's a series of kind of other issues about working with people uh, with whom you're also practicing um, and, and researching with them. So um, that doesn't entirely answer your question, but it kind of dabbles a toe in it. And um, we yeah, looking forward to talking to you and following like up that. on the conversation. Thank you very Great. much, okay. Thank you very much, Garron, for the question. Yes, just a reminder, we have the Google Doc. Just feel free to add any comments, questions, and uh, improvements, and ideas how to improve the research from the presenters in the doctoral consortium. Uh, now, uh, I introduce uh, Maina, who's going to present the third uh, poster. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for attending my poster presentation today. Um, I'm in the final year of my PhD. I am supervised by Bartri and team and uh, two other supervisors who have since left the institution, Sharon Clade and uh, Wayne Holmes. And uh, this particular poster is on a study I conducted to examine students' privacy concerns in learning analytics. I am yet to finalize with a data analysis, so this is a great opportunity for me to clarify my thinking on the work and uh, some of the arguments that I can make with the data that I have. So we begin with uh, just uh, this first section here where we talk about how learning analytics involves the collection and use of student data from various sources to inform teaching and learning practices. By observing and understanding students and their uses of institutional learning resources, interventions can be made to enhance student completion rates, instructors can design their courses based on derived insights, and students can receive personalized support, including um, learning recommendations. However, the use of student data has raised uh, privacy concerns. A number of questions, for example, what data is collected, how is data going to be used, and who has access to the data. For this particular study, we focused on examining, uh, speaking to, we focused on two questions. So whether students are concerned about privacy, thank you, <laughs> whether students are concerned about privacy in learning analytics when they're made aware of learning analytics practices, and secondly, whether their general privacy concerns and behaviors are related to their privacy concerns in the learning analytics context. We conducted the study in a lab session and we linked the work to students' study of privacy and personality. Participants were studying for a master's degree in organizational behavior at the UK University. We recruited or had 111 students take part they filled out a questionnaire on their privacy concerns, and this helped us to have a sense of what we're referring to as privacy profiles. For example, whether they had high, medium, or low levels of privacy concern. Participants also answered questions about their general privacy concern and behavior, and their level of comfort with different learning analytics practices. These questions were taken from existing work, we also then gave participants two scenarios describing the collection and use of data by the university and by Amazon. So the university has yet to, um, at least to my knowledge, uh, publicize plans to have student-facing learning analytics. So that scenario was you know, um, kind of made up, but uh, then the Amazon scenario was more realistic. I also was interested in having follow-up interviews, therefore I asked participants to sign up. So a number of them were interested. I managed to get about 50 participants who signed up for the follow-up interviews, unfortunately, because we had um, exams coming up and holidays as well. By the time I was coming back then to do the interviews, I only managed to get four uh, participants to take part. Some of, the, some of them are still um, at home on holiday. The majority of the participants were female. I had uh, that's about 90 of them, and the average age was 23 years. Most students, about 73, were from um, China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. So that's the um, Confucian Asian uh, countries. I used the globe country cluster system because I had a number of uh, students, you know, from individual countries. We compared participants' responses. We compared participants' responses across the two scenarios and found that they were more comfortable with the collection use and sharing of their data in the university than in the e-commerce context. Um, 
one of the things I need to kind of go back and verify is whether these differences were statistically significant. But I think the time that I did them, my recollection is that they were not uh, statistically significant. However, this suggests an element of trust in the university, which uh, is supported um, in related work on uh, privacy and learning analytics. For example, work by uh, Slade, uh, Prince Lou, and Halil, which was published in the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference uh, last year. Participants were specifically concerned about issues to do with the tracking, how they attract um, the activities are tracked, and also issues around sharing of their data with third parties. These results were not statistically significant. In the follow-up interviews, one of the things that was raised was just their concern about who the third parties were and how that information would influence their future opportunities, their future work opportunities, for example. And so that might explain why uh, uh, that particular issue uh, stood out for them. So secondly, we did not find a correlation between their general privacy concerns and behavior and their privacy concerns in learning analytics. Now, it may be the case that students are not aware of the institutional use of their data for learning analytics, or they may have no way to express their preferences uh, for the institutional use of their data. So these are the questions that I'm focusing on right now as part of ongoing research. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Thank you, Maina. We have time for one question. Anyone? We have comments from the uh, Google Doc. Or someone is going to talk, or it was my impression. I, I can ask a question. I kind of want to take take Juan's original question to Shimin and direct it at this poster, uh, which is sort of given all of the news about tracking um, and university systems as we think about reopening. Uh, do you think there are implications from this research and any findings that would help understand uh, how to interact with students when potentially proposing tracking systems in university settings uh, as we reopen during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks, Darren, for your question. I uh, need to think about that a little bit more. Definitely, one of the things that um, has come to mind just with this particular situation is that this is just going to be something very new. How we have uh, a number of students who are you know, used to face-to-face -face interaction during lectures, having to transition to the online context, um, where we have kind of a, 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 an ongoing you know, collection of data and so on that they may not be aware of. And so questions around how should the institution make them aware of that, how will they respond to that and so on. So definitely interesting questions uh, coming up. I don't think um, this work necessarily contributes to that case, um, but it definitely uh, gives me like additional questions I would want to explore in the current situation. So for example, as I'm saying, is it, if we see that they don't really have any privacy concerns, is it a lack of awareness about how the institution is using their data or plans to use their data? Or is it uh, more the fact that they don't really have an opportunity to control how the data is used? That then would be a, a very interesting question, I think, to explore in, in that context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maina. Thank you very much, Darren, for the question. Now we move on to the uh, presentations. Um, we invite uh, Irina to present uh, her research. Everyone, I hope you can see me well. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Irina Vett. I'm now in the final year of my PhD, writing up my thesis um, in IHC at Open University. And I'm very pleased to be presenting the final study uh, of my PhD, which is a quantitative eye tracking study where I looked at the effect of text simplification on how English non native readers understand the text and process it. Um, so let me begin. I usually, when I present the background of my research and motivations for my research, I start with the practical example, um, and I've been using it in other presentations that I have here from the earlier. So this text comes from um, the actual course, an OER course from OpenLearn platform, um, applying social work skills and practice. And that's the, the first section that OER learners in this course see among the reading materials. And if we look at the text itself, we can see that there are lots of issues or things in the text that flag how difficult it is. 
we can see, for example, that um, the very first question, uh, the very first sentence, takes um, five whole lines. It uses um, quite difficult structures, like on many occasions, it can be argued that. Um, service user, um, it has structures like something arrives at the point of leaving. So we can see that um, if we if we read the text, we can see that it is actually really difficult. Um, so even I haven't done this with native speakers of English, but I'm sure that uh, it might be the, the case that uh, even English native speakers might struggle with this text a little bit. But imagine if this text uh, was presented to all our learners who don't speak English fluently, who reside in developing countries, uh, but who use OER to learn from this text. Um, so there are quite a few barriers um, to that prevent OER um, to, to be used widely in, in, in other regions. And um, one such obstacle is the use of English itself, which is used predominantly, but there are regions who also use English in OER. Another obstacle is the language level of OER, which uh, requires advanced or native English language level. Um, so, there is uh, actually tension between what OER claims to do and in the long term, open education uh, claims to eradicate extreme poverty and, and hunger and poor education is often seen as an underlying reason for poverty. And the OER concept assumes that learners residing in developing regions will find available content usable and that doing so will provide education opportunities that these countries need in order to be liberated from poverty. But actually, as we can see, um, the language level um, in these resources um, does not allow to do that. So linguistic accessibility is the topic that I'm addressing in my thesis. Um, while there is this uh, urgent need to help uh, learners out to try to learn from the OER, there is a lack of research that conceptualizes and has solutions on how to improve accessibility of OER and open education initiatives to independent readers. Uh, most studies so far have focused on um, adapting OER to specific national contexts uh, through the use of case studies, and these solutions would only work locally. Or there are studies that look at perceptions of different stakeholders on OER through the use of interviews and opinion surveys. So these studies don't involve the actual learning. Um, I've attended a conference, um, OER19, in Galway, where um, Florence Spirit Foundation has presented their systematic literature review on OER research. And in among 126 studies that they reviewed, they found that almost half of the studies are actually desk research. So they don't involve uh, OER learners or actual participants. And most studies are qualitative. So in OER field, there is a lack of studies that would use statistical control measures, and that would involve um, participants. Um, so I also uh, aim to um, uh, fill that gap in my research. Um, one field that could potentially inform OER is accessibility, because that field looks at ways of how we can optimize learning activities to grant equal rights to different learners. Um, however, um, accessibility research hasn't um, uh, provided a focus on linguistic accessibility per se. So the solution that I'm testing uh, in evaluating my thesis um, came from English as medium of instruction literature where it was suggested that perhaps we can reduce the language level of resources and this would help not just learners in one specific language but learners globally to try to um, un understand the text and this solution can perhaps help them to understand the text faster and um, help them um, learn from the text. There are certain benefits that this solution might provide. Uh, the first benefit is actually something that I'm trying to evaluate in my thesis. Can it be generalizable to a global audience of OER learners who have different uh, language backgrounds and who have different levels of language proficiency? 
And in the long term, perhaps um, these strategies of simplifying the tax can be taken up by machine learning tools, such as um, automatic tax tools. And um, then OER platforms, OER material designers would not have to spend hours of simplifying tax manually. Um, so I conducted a, a previous study, study two in my thesis, where I worked with 24 English teachers coming from different language backgrounds, and I asked them to simplify several texts, several OER texts, and um, I put together a guideline of the strategies that we use most often. I divided them into three blocks. Uh, most strategies that uh, English teachers use were surface features modifications, so they would tweak paragraphs, tweak sentences, or change the word order. Some part of it concerned context modifications, so English teachers would elaborate on certain things in the text or cut information that they thought is irrelevant and is not important in understanding the text. And a third block was um, discourse features modifications, where English teachers tried to link the ideas in the text better together. So this is how uh, and the kind of strategies that I tested when I was using eye tracking. Um, so here's my actual study. Um, I used eye tracking uh, for several reasons. Um, it's an online methodology that provides information about how people engage with the text as it happens. It's a real-time methodology. And another beauty of it is that um, you can separate the initial reading of the text, so when our eyes land on certain elements of the text for the first time, from the time when we decide to go back to certain sentences or words or elements in the text. So I used these two eye tracking measures to do my data. First pass dictation duration, second pass dictation duration. Uh, while first pass dictation duration is an early effect, so it's subconscious, Second pass dictation duration is the most strategic behavior because we consciously decide that we need to go back in the text um, to solve certain comprehension difficulties. Um, I got consent from, from this person in the portal. This is my real participant uh, sitting in the uh, eye tracking lab in, in the Open University in IEC. Um, well, in total, I had uh, 37 English non native readers. Um, they were adult. Uh, they were adults, and um, I selected people coming from various language families. So I, I tried to see whether these strategies have a similar effect across um, language backgrounds. Um, most of my participants were university graduates, and four participants were high school leaders. This is my procedure. Um, after collecting some demographic information um, and explaining its task, um, then I controlled for their language proficiency. They completed a language test. After that, they were randomly assigned to uh, two conditions. They either read an authentic OER text or an OER text that was simplified using those strategies that I showed in the previous slide. Literature also suggests that there are certain factors that influence um, how people understand the text, and it's important to control for that. So. There was a self-reported background knowledge questionnaire and topic interest questionnaire. I also checked the comprehension of the text by asking them to retell it and complete multiple choice comprehension uh, tests, but I'm not going to talk about it in this presentation. This is my research question. So basically, effect of text simplification on text processing when controlling for these factors. Um, and with eye tracking, you have to do certain data transformation, and you have to check for the distribution and normal normality of the, of the eye tracking variables. I did that. And then I used an ANCOVO, uh, where I controlled for language proficiency, background knowledge. Um, another beauty of eye tracking is that you can decide the granularity of your analysis. You can look at eye movements across the whole text, or you can focus on certain types of words or types of sentences. So drawing from um, eye tracking literature, I um, looked at eye movements on three types of sentences. So 
So there are topic introducing sentences that introduce ideas in the text, topic medial sentences that elaborate on these ideas, and topic final sentences where people usually uh, wrap up the information that they write in, 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 the, in the text. Um, it, I found it important to differentiate between different types of sentences because um, if, for example, we find that participants focused mostly on topic introducing sentences, that means that these were some kind of inference demands on the participants. They had to spend more time understanding what the text is going to be about. But if participants spend mostly um, fo their focus is on topic final sentences, that means that they just try to integrate the information better from what they uh, read in the text. So differentiation between the sentences tells us a little bit about the, type, the, the kind of processing that's happening that when we read the, the text. So let's turn, uh, talk about my results. So this is descriptive statistics from my study. It was the main effect of condition. So it was important whether it was a simplified or an authentic OER when controlling for um, these particular individual factors. And what I found for initial processing was that participants processed all three sentences longer in the simplified condition. So it took them longer to read all three types of sentences. Um, there were some similarities and some differences. So for example, um, uh, the initial processing was shortest for topic medial sentences. Um, so the first time participants read the text, they looked at medial sentences the shortest. Um, however, the difference was that in authentic OER, participants looked mostly on um, topic introducing sentences. I'm actually using my mouse, but I, I noticed that no one can see it. Um, so yes, this, this part was, was longer in authentic text. But in simplified condition, participants focused mostly on topic final sentences. Um, how about the second part fixation duration? So when participants decided to reread the text, um, there was also a main effect of condition. So again, uh, text simplification induced different ty uh, type of processing. And um, uh, unlike the initial processing, in this section of the text, in simplified OER, it was shorter. So uh, participants looked at all three types of sentences shorter in simplified OER as compared to the authentic condition. Um, and actually, in simplified OER, participants spent significantly less time rereading topic introducing sentences. Um, they almost just very quickly looked through it, through it, unlike the authentic condition where they had to go back and read it once again, um, trying to you know, um, understand what the, the, those types of sentences are about. Um, unlike uh, the initial processing, what I found for the rereading of the text was that language proficiency was found to have significant effect. Um, and participants in high English proficiency groups spend significantly less time rereading the text as compared to participants in lower English proficiency groups. And when I split them and conducted my analysis separately, I found that um, condition only had a significant effect on um, high uh, English proficiency groups. In the low proficiency, they also spent less time reinspecting simplified OER. However, this difference was not statistically significant from the reinspection time of the text. And I'm slowly moving on to discussion and conclusions. So the first conclusion uh, from my study is that text simplification and language level matters if we look at text processing. So when we reduce the language level of the OER, it does induce different kind of processing. Text simplification slowed down processing during the initial reading, which is not in line with literature, which suggests that facilitative effect of modification was found in speeding up of processing. However, I found that this speeding up happened during text inspection. 
So the readers, they have to uh, take a, a look back less time. They had perhaps, that means that they had fewer comprehension difficulties that they needed to resolve during look back in the simplified OER, which is actually then a facilitator to fast attack simplification. I also found that there was a reduced processing difference in simplification between different sentence types. Um, so the reading was smoother in simplified OER. The participants moved smoothly. They spent more or less equal amount of time in reading different sentence types. However, their focus was a bit longer on topic final sentences in the simplified condition, which is also another evidence of facilitative effect of text simplification because this is good for wrap up processing of the text. I also found that language proficiency plays an important role specifically on uh, the inspection of the text. My implications, um, so I have methodological implications uh, because in literature there was no other study in text simplification that used eye tracking. Um, I, I found that it's important to separate the initial processing of the text from the inspection because my study showed that there are different results that come from, from these different measures and it provides a more a, a fuller picture of how people process the text if we look at each measure separately. Um, and a more time sensitive picture as well of how people deal with the text. And I have specific practical implications for material design. So first, linguistic complexity plays an essential role and all this also confirms the first study in my PhD where, that, where I looked at how difficult we are, are in terms of their language level. And my study provided some emerging uh, support evidence in favor of using text simplification as a strategy to help uh, OER learners with different language backgrounds and different proficiency levels. So perhaps if we use vocabulary of higher frequency, if we skip long sentences, if we avoid using passive voice, we can actually help those people um, for whom OER are actually meant uh, from the from the beginning, so we can help them process the text better. These are my references, and I hope I'm on time. Um, thank you for your attention, and um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Irina. Indeed, very interesting and well explained. Time for questions. I see people typing. I would assume so, Garon. Please go ahead. Okay. Yep. Great. Uh, so, if I only have time for one, um, I guess one of the things that I'll point out in the slide, if you could go back to your implications slide, mm -hmm. uh, in the practical implications, you talk about the essential role in understanding the text. And in the presentation, I saw a lot of details on the processing of text. Um, was there an outcome measure of uh, comprehension that you're comparing this against? Or are you framing this as, I guess, could you clarify that for me first? Did I miss, miss a, a bit about comprehension or, or learning outcomes? Or is this more of an emphasis on process? Uh, I had, uh, so when I was showing the procedure of my study, I think it will take some time to, to click through uh, the slides. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I did check their comprehension. I asked them to retell each test, and I also had multiple choice comprehension tests. So okay. I just didn't have time to present those results, but they Great. did. Uh, converge with what my eye tracking data showed. Great. So when you're talking about learning outcomes, um, I've seen other work that does optimizations, and I would consider this in sort of a domain of optimization of processing. Uh, they typically look at both short-term and long-term outcomes of, of both comprehension immediately after the task and retention of knowledge. And I was curious in your outcome measures if you've been looking at retention uh, sometimes it's like you know the examination immediately after and then a follow-up uh, a month or two down the road. Uh, to see what retention rates are like. Have you looked at retention as well as uh, immediate outcomes? 
That's a great question. And I actually indicated it as a limitation of my research uh, because eye tracking is um, a, a concurrent kind of um, tool. So it does show immediate effect of what you're doing, but it doesn't really tell us much about the quality of learning from the text. So indeed, in order to control for that, we need a, a long-term retention task, perhaps a delayed comprehension task. I did not do it this time because um, um, immediate comprehension assessment and um, real-time eye tracking data, they, they converge to show the same thing, that uh, text simplification indeed facilitates um, how people engage with the text. But I agree with you that, yes, it's very important to also do a delayed task, which I didn't do in my PhD. Yeah, because there, there are other optimization systems out there that have found that you can get faster, better, immediate response with correct answers that actually have negative impacts on longer term outcomes. So sometimes you want to make sure that you're looking at both of those dimensions. Um, but I have a bunch of other questions for you. I'll put them in the document. Thank you. I'm looking forward to reading them. Yes, please take the benefit of using the document that we will circulate afterwards with the presenters and, and we'll give feedback uh, for them. So thank you very much, Irina. Uh, we are going to move forward to uh, Stephen. Yeah. Stephen is going to present. Uh, present. With yeah. The tech there, Paco. Can you see my video? Not yet. Not yet. There. You've got to appear. Screen, you? Yes. I, see it. I do not know why that's not sharing. I suspected that wasn't going to work. Well, I will start anyway. Um, it might mm -hmm. it might click in. Uh, I've got no idea why it's not working. I think it's because it's a really old video camera. And it doesn't really like Windows 10, so it probably doesn't like Adobe Connect. Uh, anyway, I'll crack on because I'm aware that we're short of time. Um, this presentation is about the extent to which graphical feedback from a rainbow diagram. Oh, I think you've got me now. Um, right. Quick explanation as I know on video, I think um, my camera is set off to the right of my screen. So I'm going to be moving my head like this. And I hope that's not too distracting. So I do apologize. So I will start again. This presentation is about the extent to which um, graphical feedback from a rainbow diagram can help students develop coherence with their academic writing. And the research was the first of four studies that I undertook for my PhD project. And this is the first presentation where I've run through methodologies and talked about the results. I know a lot of you uh, know who I am because uh, you work with me at the IET. But for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stephen Foster. I'm a third year PhD student here at the IET. And something that I've left off the slide is the names of my supervisors who are Professor Denise Whitelock, Dr. Simon Cross, and Dr. Karen Kerr. So what am I going to talk to you about? I'm going to give a very brief description, first of all, about what automated feedback is. And I'm also going to very briefly tell you what a rainbow diagram is. And one with the brief theme, I'm going to briefly put the research in context of some of the literature. I'll then run through the aims of the research, the methods that I used, and findings and then I'll bring all that together in a discussion at the end. So the first thing to talk about is what is automated feedback. In very broad terms it can be defined as computer generated feedback given to students on the assignments that they write um, and it's normally done through text or graphical displays. The feedback might include information on the structure of the assignment, its coherence. Um, some automated feedback systems also give feedback on the content. Feedback might be formative, 
and therefore give the student the chance to reflect on it before they actually submit their assignment for marking. Sometimes formative feedback will give an indicative mark. Again, that depends on the automated feedback system itself. Feedback might be summative and given as part of the assessment process itself. And in such circumstances, it would be normal to include a mark. Automated feedback itself has several terms that can be used to describe it. Automated writing evaluation, automated essay evaluation, and automated essay scoring. All of those terms are a form of automated feedback. In themselves, they're all slightly different, but they all come under the general heading of automated feedback. There are very, very many different forms of automated feedback system that have been developed that do different things. Three examples I put on screen there. Um, first one is Criterion, which is a relatively well-known system. It's used in the United States, um, both in universities and schools. Lightside, which is developed from open source software, and Open Essayist, which was developed here at the Open University in collaboration with Oxford University and is the feedback system which I've used in my research and it's the feedback system that the rainbow diagram comes from. Open SAS provides formative feedback to students on their academic writing and two examples of that feedback are on the right hand side of the screen, uh, key sentence feedback and word cloud feedback. So the development of automated writing evaluation systems, automated feedback has been facilitated by development of natural language processing and that ongoing development of AI and computer processing generally is likely to facilitate the more nuanced um, development of feedback for students as time progresses. So we'll now go on and I'll explain to you very briefly what a rainbow diagram is. Quite simply, it's a pictorial representation of essay structure. Each of those nodes or dots that you can see on the screen there represents a sentence in the assignment. The first sentence in the assignment is coloured violet and the nodes representing the sentences then change colour through the rainbow spectrum and the last sentence is coloured red. And the closer the nodes are together, the better and more well structured and more coherent the essay will be. That is assuming that it's on topic, because one thing the rainbow diagram at present can't do is analyse content. And if you've got a well structured essay, you're more likely to get a higher mark for it. The more spread out the nodes are, the less well structured the essay will be and therefore it's likely that the mark received for it will be lower. And previous research that has been done by Whitelock et al. has actually shown a correlation between the compactness of the rainbow diagram and the mark awarded by the tutor. So I'll now briefly run through some of the literature on assessment feedback just to put what I'm doing in context. Good academic writing, as we know, is structured in sequence to produce an argument which is supported by evidence. And when drafting academic writing, feedback on what's been done well and what needs improving is really useful for a student to have. Such feedback of itself should develop both, develop both learning and also academic writing skills and it should motivate the students as well to carry on with their learning to write what they're aiming to write. Importantly feedback should be timely and it's this timeliness of feedback that in part has driven the development of automated writing assessment tools. Modern technology not only facilitates automated writing evaluation tools, but it also facilitates hints on how to use those tools. So for example, within 
open essayist in the rainbow diagram there is a button on the rainbow diagram that you can click and you can get some reflective hints on that suggesting how you might use the feedback that you receive as Hattie and Timpley said feedback is one of the most powerful factors affecting learning although that effectiveness varies on how the feedback is delivered and it's because of that that it's important to investigate the pedagogic use of feedback from automated feedback systems so that brings me on to what I was doing with this study I had three aims how do students interpret the rainbow diagram how might students use the rainbow diagram to improve their academic writing and what barriers if any do students perceive to use of the rainbow diagram so how did I go about doing that well I used semi-structured interviews supported by an eye tracker and the interviews were divided into three parts so I'm going to run through each of those three parts now so part one was a paper-based exercise to inform students about the rainbow diagram and explore the extent to which they can interpret the rainbow diagram based on their understanding of it the students were provided with instructions on how to interpret the rainbow diagram they then undertook a paper-based exercise where they had to identify four groups of rainbow diagrams in a folder those four groups represented high medium and low grade essays and the final group represented Stanford Blue Prize essays which were essays written to very high standard of the Stanford Blue Prize essay competition and then whilst deciding which group of rainbow diagrams presented which type of essay the students used the course allowed protocol to explain the reasoning behind the decisions that they made for part two students provided me with a sample of their own academic writing and from that I produced a rainbow diagram which was displayed to the students on a computer they then viewed the rainbow diagram and again using think aloud protocol indicated what they thought the rainbow diagram suggested about their piece of writing and how they thought they might use the diagram to improve that writing and whilst they were undertaking that task their eyes were followed by the eye tracker so that came on to correlate what they said about where they were looking and what they were doing which leads us on to part three because in part three of the interview you stimulated recall using the eye tracker to discuss why the students were looking at parts of the rainbow diagram that they were and I used two elements of the eye tracker the gaze plot and the heat map and there are examples of both of those on the right hand side of the screen so the gaze plot illustrates the track taken by students as they looked at the diagram the heat map shows where a student's gaze was most concentrated in the red area on that map indicates where the gaze was most concentrated as previously students used the think aloud protocol to explain why their gaze went to the part of the rainbow diagram it did and explained what they were thinking at that particular point having done the interviews the interviews were transcribed and then encoded using in vivo and then I followed Vaughan and Clark's six phase thematic analysis process to develop those codes into themes and essentially the eye tracking data was used to triangulate what the students had said about how they viewed the rainbow diagram so going on to findings what did part one of the interview find out demonstrated that students were able to understand the rainbow diagram and match essay type to a particular diagram uh, students tended to do this by making a visual comparison between the rainbow diagrams to determine 
which ones represented which types of essay. They were helped in this analysis by different coloured nodes of the rainbow diagram. Some students did find it more challenging than others to differentiate in, put my teeth back in to differentiate between the high grade essays and the medium grade essays as the difference between those two types of rainbow diagram could be quite nuanced. Um, a couple of students felt they were unable to distinguish between the high grade essays and the Stanford Booth Prize essays. However, the rainbow diagrams produced by the Stanford Booth Prize essays were really um, much more compact versions of the high grade essay diagrams. So that's perhaps understandable and I don't really think detracts from the findings of the research that students who took part in it were able to differentiate between rainbow diagrams or the different essay types. So going on to uh, part two. When students viewed a rainbow diagram of their own academic writing, they were able to use the diagram as a visual clue as to the cohesiveness and interconnectivity of that writing. Um, and they demonstrated a, a broad understanding of how they could improve their writing using the rainbow diagram. And they tended to do that by identifying the nodes within the rainbow diagram that outlay from the center. And that encouraged them to reflect on what within their writing was represented by their those particular nodes and whether that particular element of their writing needed changing. And in doing that, the color of the outlier node provided an indication as to which element of the essay the student needed to review to find out which centers the node might relate to. Overall, students felt the use of the rainbow diagram could facilitate an improvement in their writing. However, they also viewed the rainbow diagram critically and made some suggestions as to what would improve it for them. So going on to the eye tracker and the triangulation element of the interview. The heat maps showed that students' attention was attracted most to the center of the rainbow diagram. And the gaze plot tended to show that students initially looked at the center of the rainbow diagram and then moved out to have a look at the outlier nodes. And the gaze then tended to go from the outlier nodes to the center to the outlier nodes and back again as they worked their way around the diagram. And that pattern continued until they'd completed a review of the diagram. And that does triangulate with what the students said um, in their Think Aloud protocols about how they went about viewing the diagram itself. So bringing all that together, several things were identified from the interviews. Uh, the first one of which was student writing challenges students do wish to have confidence that what they've written is cohesive and well structured and something else which perhaps wasn't expecting to find but it makes sense to me now students whose first language is not English would like to have confidence that they've written good English and well structured English and that was something that the rainbow diagram was able to do. Following on from that, it could be concluded that the rainbow diagram has the ability to provide confidence to students that they have written a well structured, coherent piece of work. And as one student commented, normally they get someone else to read through their work and give some feedback on it. And the rainbow diagram was able to do that without the involvement of third party. The rainbow diagram was able to encourage students to reflect on what they'd written and they were able to use the knowledge they gained of the rainbow diagram as part one exercise to 
do that and critically review their writing. Again, as one student said, I think I know what the problem is. Looking at the diagram, there's something in the main body of the text which is totally irrelevant. And through the diagram, they were able to go to that and find out what it was. And then we're talking about a draft essay here. They would be able to do something about that. Research did identify some barriers to student engagement with the rainbow diagram. One student did say, don't find it particularly intuitive in terms of how to interpret it. And that comment does identify that it's important that students using the rainbow diagram do get suitable instruction on how to use and interpret it. And furthermore, it is acknowledged that the rainbow diagram is made up of coloured nodes, and that does have some accessibility issues for people with some forms of visual impairment. So, in conclusion and bringing everything together, um, the study was one of four studies that I did for my PhD. It investigated how students might use a rainbow diagram to improve their writing. The methods used were contextual semi-structured interviews triangulated by eye tracking data. The methods were semi-structured interviews making use of the eye tracker broken down into three parts and in the context of the study rainbow diagram feedback demonstrated the ability to provide confidence that work with written in a well coherent and well structured way and that it could facilitate reflection on student writing. So thank you for listening and happy to take questions if we've got time, but I know we're now in the coffee break. Thank you very much, Stephen. We have time for one question. And please, a reminder, use as much as possible the Google Doc for feedback to presenters. Yep. I noticed uh, Leslie raised her hand, so um, if Leslie would like to ask her a question, I think you're going to be the, the one and only for Stephen. Excellent. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, it's a bit of an ill-formed question at the moment, Stephen, but um, I'm just uh, wondering, is, is there a um, limit on the size of the document that's appropriate for automated essay feedback? And can we use automated essay feedback to help us construct our theses in the later stages of drafting and then following on from that if you've got an outlier on the diagram maybe it's just because I don't understand the process sufficiently well but how do you actually then pinpoint what that outlier is in the text and so that you can tell which bit of the text needs improving um, thanks a lot right um as far as word limit size is concerned, um, when we did the um, the study, there was a word limit of approximately 5,000 words that open essays could take. Um, that was something that had been set by the developers, so there is the facility to have that higher or lower. What the theoretical maximum is, um, I don't know, but yes, there is the a technical point of view and ability to have a higher word limit. In terms of easily knowing what the outlier nodes are, when we actually did the study, um, we could use some of the other open essays feedback, such as a thing called a dispersion plot, to, based on the colour of the, the node, work out roughly where in the essay that node would be sentence represented by that node would be and then look at the dispersion plot to see what the key words were there. Um, the most common bit of feedback that I've had since I've done this study both in my PhD and also in my MRIS which was on the rainbow diagram as well where students would like to be able to put a cursor over the rainbow diagram node and know which sentence that represents because obviously from a technical point of view um, that would be really, really useful. And there is a possibility that if um, open essays need to be developed further, that that is something that might be worked out. But technically, it's not my 
just put it does that answer your question Liz? yeah it does a little bit um yeah thank you Stephen thank you very much um that that's my immediate reaction which is that I wrote in the chat is that in order to have some kind of um supportive ongoing um, improvement mechanism for the student, they, they need to be able to interpret quickly um, uh, the, the information that the rainbow diagram is giving them in terms of outliers and for, to be able to link that up with their text so they're not so it's not becoming tool led that they're not spending ages trying to interpret the information from the tool but they're immediately yeah. able to apply it to their work. So um, thanks very much for the reflection. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, I think we can uh, go now for a short break, and then we will continue with the second session of the Australian Consortium. So, yeah, five minutes break, and we come back. <laughs>